So our first speaker is uh, Lucas Talpers. He is a professor at the Department of Radiotherapy in the University Hospital in Amsterdam. In the Netherlands, we were surprised by the sudden appearance of vitamin B clinics. Um, and we dug into that. And um, Professor Stalpers is going to explain what he found when uh, he uh, investigated the problem of vitamin B clinics. Professor Stalpers. Thank you, Catherine, for the, both the nice introduction and invitation. And uh, for the Dutch people here, this is a very, very special place because this university is where the Dutch modern state was founded. And very few knew, knew that Johan Torwecke, the first professor of statistics, was, when he was 24 years old, professor here at the university until 1933, when uh, the Netherlands and Belgium got into a quarrel and he had to leave the country. And so he became prime minister in the Netherlands and wrote our new uh, fundamental laws. Uh, having said that, um, I will discuss uh, about nonsensical therapies which have their base into regular medicine. And I will illustrate that to the vitamin B clinics. And I prepared that together with uh, Boer Scholtens. He's the journalist in our uh, uh, Vereniging tegen de Kwakselverij, Dutch Society Against Quakery. And uh, Nico Terpstra, a family physician in Horen, also member of our society. Who of you has seen the film Dr. Nock? Or heard of it? I read the book. Yeah. Oh, of course, well, you, you have read it 20 times. It's a, written already in 1923 by Jules Romain, and it's here where uh, Dr. Nock, a young, ambitious doctor, leaves for a uh, new practice on the, on the countryside. Uh, where uh, Dr. Pellegrin, a retired old man, uh, leaves and he comes into his practice and he finds, finds actually on Monday hardly anyone in his waiting room. And so he starts um, in instructions in his, in, in, in the fisting, uh, and visiting and, and talking about health and disease and uh, how uh, people should, should be aware about, um, um, about the complaints and symptoms they have. And, well, the end of the story is that uh, one, half, one and a half hour later, when the theater play stops, that his um, waiting room is overcrowded with patients. This talk is about professional mongering between medicine and quakery. It's about uh, what we used to call medicalization, pathologization, abuse of uh, registered drugs and registered technology uh, by doctors, not necessarily by, um, by quacks, by, 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 our, uh, by old aunts on a, uh, some, some are far away farm who prescribes you uh, acupuncture, homeopathy, or, or, or herbs. No, these are real uh, doctors who start uh, commercial clinics, and that mushroom, and in, 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 we have heard it already just uh, by Norbert Aust, it's very, very popular to have these types of, of, of clinics in, in, in Germany, it's weighing heavily on the Krankenkassen there. Uh, it, it, it makes the, the, the uh, affordability of the Krankenkassen almost impossible. And the same is happening now in the Netherlands where, where uh, um, we see those mushrooming private clinics, market. Uh, and um, I will talk about, say, 30 minutes, and I think we have uh, 15 minutes maybe to, to discuss where are those borders between what, what is Quakery, what is ordinary medicine. That's quite a bit more difficult, Jan Willem, than in physics. 
causality. You know, when uh, causality in physics is that you, you, you take a ball, drop it, and it falls down, and you do it a lot of times, and you, you become very famous, you become Newton, and, uh, and, and, that's, and the ball always drops down. That, that's, that's actually what Newton tells you. Or, or, uh, and that's not always the case in medicine. You know, by first hand, probably you have a 95-year-old uncle kept on smoking, kept on smoking, and he said, yeah, he was 95 years old and he was still smoking. Yeah, if he hadn't smoked, he would have become 105. Um, so, against this, um, and this, this difficulty about prob probabilities, in, uh, I think uh, medicine is, a, is an art of probability, and that had already been recognized in 19th century, long ago, that, that, that some people um, get cured by themselves, other are being cured by the medication, and because you're treating individuals, you have to rely on probabilities from larger groups. Well, that is actually has become the topic of clinical epidemiology to find out what is cause and effect in medicine. And one of the, the, the nestors in epidemiology is, is Sir Austin Bradford Hill, and he put on some relative criteria where evidence-based medicine, what's later being called evidence-based medicine, should, be, uh, um, should, should look like. And the two most important criteria for today are biological plausibility. Well, Norbert just talked long about homeopathy, the pro and he explained very well that there's no biological plausibility in homeopathy. What was it? Mix it, shake it, bullshit. Dilute it, dilute it, shake it, talk bullshit. Bullshit, yeah. <laughs> Bi uh, uh, biological plausibility, tit, 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 tit. Uh, and experiment. It should, that's, the, that's the other thing, that you have, uh, simply have evidence based, based on trials, studies, that uh, a new drug or a new technology or an old drug or an old technology works. Uh, and then there's the, the curious story of the mushrooming vitamin B12 clinics. And these are specifically for non-specific symptoms and vague complaints. You might Question why a radiation oncologist? I'm treating patients with cancer. I'm not an internist. I'm not a family physician. Why a radiation oncologist got interested into vitamin B12? Well, it's quite clear. 90% of my patients who has been, have been treated, who have been cured from cancer, complain about non-specific symptoms and fake complaints like fatigue, numbness of the fingers, uh, difficulty in sleeping, all kinds of those things where you cannot have grip on and where there are indeed very few effective treatments for. So, but these patients are keeping looking. They are really, they ha the, the problems they have are real. So I'm not discussing or, or, or putting into doubt that they, these patients don't have fatigue, that they don't have uh, headaches and, 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 and whatever. But I'm discussing putting to doubt the way how some of my fellow colleagues are treating them with nonsense therapy. Well, this is vitamin B. Vitamin B12 is uh, uh, normally, uh, it's, a, it's a natural drug. It, it's, you can find it in almost any animal foods, cobalamina. Um, I know that there are, since tomorrow, I know that there are a lot of chemists, so I put extra picture for, the, for you in, and you really recognize, oh no, you mirrored it. And And to show that it is a real scientific presentation today, I explain a bit. The, the, the next two slides are the most difficult. So, 
after lunch it's really difficult to, to swallow. It's not giving light, but I can do it. Through the diet, the vitamin B, nom 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 nom, you had, I, I had just had a salmon hamburger, so here's the dietary B12 in that salmon hamburger, going into the stomach, and there, by a combination of, of, of uh, acid and a pepsin, uh, and a quite essential um, here, that the, the intrinsic factor, why it's called intrinsic factor, because it's called intrinsic factor, that's typically medicine. It's split up, and you need, so you need the stomach to be able to absorb the vitamin B, and there it goes. In, it's, it's resorbed in the intestine, and it goes into the cell, and there it is an, an, a coenzyme of a lot of energetic processes which are involved in restoring nerves, in uh, repa repairing um, damage to, to nerves, in, uh, in producing particularly blood cells, particularly the red blood cells. So it's then, if you know that, then it's quite easy to understand why people with a really severe vitamin B12 deficiency that they develop neuropathic disturbances and that they develop anemia. I, this is what happens in the mitochondria where the vitamin B here in the middle is the coenzyme to metabolize methylmalonic acid into succinyl-CoA and on the other hand homocysteine into methionine. So you can also understand that if you have a deficiency of this vitamin B12, if the, in the serum the vitamin B12 is low, that uh, this methyl melanoic acid goes up and homocysteine goes up. So these three, if you, you know, now recognize, and then the rest of the story will be easy. So what does true vitamin B12 deficiency do? It gives signs and symptoms of very swollen, big, lazy, and too, too little red cells, macrocytic anemia we could, it's in, 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 in uh, medicine, and it, you can have a lot of neurological symptoms, particularly sensory loss. You don't feel your feet very well, so those patients come wiggling into your practice room, and when you measure the vitamin B12, it's really too low. It's arbitrary we have taken, I think it's because uh, um, it, it went from grams per liter, milligrams per liter to molars per liter. It's below 148, not, uh, so it's an error in my slide. It's not 100, it's more, less than four. That's a nonsense. Uh, so, and what are true causes of vitamin B12 deficiency? The main cause, you understand, is malabsorption of vitamin, vitamin B12. And is it a rare thing to have? No, actually it's not that very rare. All surgeons, is there a surgeon in the room? Ooh, I'm getting nervous now. What happens when I have my appendix? Um, Oh, that's good. No problem. <laughs> woof, woof. Um, but actually, after gastric bypass surgery, sometimes for very, very obese patients, you can simply bypass the stomach, and uh, so a lot of, a lot of, uh, of energy is lost. You can eat as much as you want, and it, it is going out. Yeah. Medicine is a dirty job. I'm, I chose it myself by through diarrhea. It goes out very quickly, and you lose a lot of kilograms in, a, uh, 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 in quick time. And um, these patients, the 90% of them develops vitamin B12 deficiency. I think in Belgium there are about 60 to 70,000 of those patients. Quite a lot. 
do they need a commercial vitamin B12 clinic? No, of course not. The family physician knows, the surgeon physician knows and gives them a, a, a jar of vitamin B B12 pills, take them every day, and you won't develop these complications. Let me show you a nice uh, randomized st study that you don't even need injections. The other is alcoholism and a strict vegan diet. Actually, quite a few of food laws, both in Belgium and in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, require that, um, that, that some foods have to contain vitamin B12 addi uh, as addition. I don't know why it's legally organized, but probably to prevent this malnutrition. Another is uh, uh, pernicious anemia or atrophic gastritis, and, uh, and the, the real internists make even more dis uh, subtle uh, uh, distinguishes between it, but virtually all of them are autoimmune disease, readily uh, uh, recognizable, uh, easily to diagnose, and easily to treat with oral vitamin B12. I told you it is very easy for a doctor and, uh, to, to diagnose this. First ask, take a history, a history which is taken in three or four minutes. Ask if he had surgery, ask about his nutrition, if there's vegan, uh, vegan problems, if there are alcoholic problems, uh, medication use. The simple things, with, 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 with these three questions you have already 95% of your uh, vitamin B12 deficiency diagnosed. Um, physical examination, paleness due to the anemia, a thin mucus epithelium, through the autoimmune disease, uh, the, the, the mucus epithelium becomes very thin and, and, and smooth. It, 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 um, uh, and it's almost diagnostic for pernicious anemia if they have it all through their mouth. Um, simple blood tests can usually be done already in, in family practice. Blood count, hemoglobin, and the cell size can be done by any uh, medical student or a nurse uh, in, in your practice. Vitamin B12, you have to send it to the local uh, um, hospital or laboratory. There is, as I uh, will explain later, discussion if you should test methyl malonic acid right away, and there actually uh, homocysteine uh, measurement is not indicated at all. And if you suspect pernicious anemia, you send it to an internist and does one gastroscopy actually more to, to, to see if there are no rare causes of autoimmune um, gastritis. And then with this package, you have 99% of all cases. And what is the treatment? Um, that's when you prepare a talk that there can enter errors in your abstract or things I thought they were. The simple answer now is oral treatment with vitamin B12 is probably enough. Even for the cases where most guidelines say that you need injections of vitamin B12. I showed right away. After gastric bypass, I corrected my slide from injections with vitamin B to oral vitamin B12. Malnutrition, of course, feed them well and feed, give them some extra vitamins of any. Atrophic gastritis is probably the one and only reason to give vitamin B12 injections, and that's the cases with half neurologic, severe neurological symptoms. Probably these, this group readily diagnosed which needs vitamin B12 injections. And then there are, uh, yeah, the, the patients who come late with neurological symptoms, give them one shot of vitamin B12 injections, look at the cause. If the cause is readily uh, understood, continue with oral vitamin B12. I'm talking here about 80 cents. This is also 80 cents in drugs. This is 80 cents, and even the injections is two euro fifty.
Um, I told you that, that in the official guidelines, the um, vitamin B12 injections is still indicated for after gastric bypass. Well, there's a recent study from, uh, the, uh, from a large uh, bariatric surgery, group bariatric surgery is the surgery for those obese patients, and they did a randomized study between oral vitamin B12 and uh, injections, and was equally effective. Um, but you should give instead of one pill of vitamin B12, you, you have to give them two pills per day. So there also the injections is not indicated. Uh, well, there's no evidence like no evidence. Wang and Andrus, uh, also recent studies show that uh, there is, yeah, they concluded very carefully in the Cochrane review, low quality evidence shows oral and intramuscular vitamin B12 having similar effects, and no trial reported on clinical signs and symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency, health-related quality of life, or acceptability of the treatment scheme. There is no evidence that you should treat fatigue with vitamin B12. Nobody carefully studied that. There is no real good study on the quality of life. Why then prescribe it for this indication? Well, this is a warning from the website. Be aware, next week or uh, actually, this is the post. I, I, I did a bit fraudulent. I took the post of last year. The vitamin B12 organization, Brit an uh, American organization, has an awareness week for B12, and they want. They have submitted to the uh, uh, what is it, uh, secretary now, the secretary general. What, what do they have in the United States of Health? to make uh, this week an official week in the United States so that everywhere it's posted, uh, take your vitamin B12 shots. And you can't read it at the, uh, at the end, it's for depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, uh, postnatal depression, infertility, autism, dementia, Alzheimer's, ALS, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, ME, CFS, I don't know what CFS is, congestive heart failure, FND, I don't know what it is, neuropathy, fibromyalgia, ADHD, I know it because my neighbor has it, psychosis, and more. That's also a typical sign of quakery. One drug which helps all. Could it be B12? I won't keep calling doctor, I need my B12 injections now. Well, and that's what we see now in the Netherlands that we see blooming vitamin B12 clinics. I frequently discussed with Dr. Hajo Awarda, he is one of the directors of the clinic in Amsterdam. He's, he was first in Rotterdam before he became an internist and there his friends have a B12 institute. And you see, this, is, this, this picture is from there. Oh, look how, does it look happy or does it look terrible? What, what does this good kid look like? I don't know. But that's how they advertise. And how do they more advertise? No referral is needed. He is a registered internist. So he can start now with private practice, his own internal medicine practice, and he can ask the prices for internal medicine. So no referral needed. You can make an appointment yourself. A cost at a family physician in the Netherlands is 30 euros, 30 euros. But he can ask 300 euros, but actually that's only for one visit. If you pay more and yeah, you need to repeat the shots of the vitamin B12, you have 1,500 euros. And it is indeed covered by our health insurance. And um, the other trick they have is we have a scientific advisory board and I was really shocked. And this, that is what makes this, uh, at first I thought, well, I'm talking about nothing, you were talking about big problems. One of the advisors which I discussed already uh, four years ago with is Professor Bruce Wolfenbüttel. He's a respected internist, internist endocrinologist, can make also 
on his website of the university, he advertises for repeated vitamin B12 tests and repeated and early treatment of marginally low serum vitamin B12. And I told, uh, I showed you already that there are no randomized trials which, which compare really what it does on fatigue on, and on those fake symptoms. And he said, yeah, it's ethically very difficult. Tell me, explain me why it's ethically not done to have somebody who's already years of fatigue, randomize them between fake pills and real pills and follow them three months and then double blind and then ask, ask the questionnaire again and then do a, maybe a, a crossover study. It's such a simple study. Well, I call, tried to call him yesterday. He wasn't in. Um, but he, um, the, the, the study is not, still not submitted at the, the, the ethical board of the Groningen University. A more worrisome case is this guy, Jan Hendricks Richardes, professor. Why? Because he's an epidemiologist. I think if, as an epidemiologist, you don't acknowledge or don't look to the evidence there is, particularly the epidemiological evidence that, there, that this treatment is nonsense, I don't know. Maybe you should go to one of those private practices yourself. He did a study and where he, uh, of 70,000 samples of the Rotterdam population, of course it's Rotterdam, but 45% of them has vitamin B12 deficiency. So my recommendation is don't visit Rotterdam, it's very dangerous. And then I asked him, did you check other signs or symptoms? No, no, we are really, really very busy doing that. The problem is that these are rooted, those advisory boards of these clinics, and there are more clinics, that they are rooted into ordinary medicine, and they, have, they, 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 they shine the authority of, trust me, I'm a doctor. And of course, that patients, um, they say, well, well but, but he's really respected. Yes. Uh, but again, there is no evidence like no evidence. Um, there is no evidence in a Cochrane review that it works for cognitive dysfunction. There's very little evidence and a lot of money invested, um, but they found a, a very um, marginal um, correlation between patients with Alzheimer disease and low vitamin B12. But the same studies notified, but a lot of those Alzheimer patients were also underfed. Um, it doesn't work in older patients. And the guideline is there is no tests to, uh, to really verify if there's vitamin B12 deficiency with certainty. Um, indeed, they recommend to treat below 145 picomoles, and, and, and my recommendation, if you start treating, do it just with oral medication. It's very cheap, and you can get it around the corner. Um, symptomatic cases are in incidentally seen, and they should be, could be treated with, with uh, uh, injections. Uh, oral supplementation, I told you before, Marginal cases, you could test MMIA, but there's actually no evidence um, this, which supports this rec official recommendation of the Family Physicians Society. And also more a practical recommendation, if you have patients with severe neurological symptoms, start a treatment uh, right away with injections. That's, well, what's wrong with vitamin B12 is obvious. It's overdiagnosis, it's overtreatment, it's costly, it, 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 it's nonsense, it's, uh, and, uh, and, and it leads to a lot of inappropriate treatment for pe people with, uh, with real complaints and real symptoms. And it's not just vitamin B12, it's Lyme's disease. We have three or four uh, Lyme disease clinics in the Netherlands, and some are even integrated into Dutch hospitals. Amersfoort has an 
clinic for Lyme disease uh, integrated into each hospital. It's whiplash clinics. We have the diagnostic screening uh, clinics, the pre-scan, actually in, in more in, um, a, a diagnostic, um, diagnostic nonsense. We have independent hypothermia centers which offer hypothermia for the same list that I showed you before where you can give vitamin B12. So my last slide is then conclusion, what next? The guidelines of the family doctor should also be adopted by other medical societies, including the Society of Internists and Surgeons. We need to continuously educate patients and doctors with appropriate attention and care for patients and their complaints and symptoms. And uh, except for severe cases of vitamin B12, those uh, injections can be considered as Quakery. And this is from a, a, a cartoon from our Dutch newspapers. Fokker and Sukker love their family doctor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, you talk about the Netherlands, but probably elsewhere in Europe we, we see the same, all kinds of private clinics popping up with an attention to just one part of medicine or a vague diagnosis. Is there anybody who wants to ask a question? Jan Willem Nienhuis. Uh, wait for the microphone, microphone so we can have the up. question also on our videotape for later. <laughs> In your list of um, possible causes for vitamin B12 deficiency, I thought there is a fourth cause, namely overconsumption of laughing gas. Could you comment on that? Oh, that's my department. Oh. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, an anesthesiologist, and uh, in general anesthesia, we have stopped using uh, nitrous oxide as much as possible. Uh, if you in the past, if you would give nitrous oxide for a maximum of four hours, it would be okay. It would not interfere with the vitamin B, B metabolism for too much. But nowadays, there are teenagers uh, who use nitrous oxide on a daily basis, and they do get problems with their vitamin B uh, uh, status. And we have a few. Uh, young guys who have severe neurological problems from everyday uh, nitrous oxide use, they end up in a wheelchair. They destroy di their neurological system with daily nitrous oxide. So, uh, but they should just stop using nitrous oxide and take the pills and not go to a vitamin B clinic. I'm glad she's sitting next to me. It, it was almost orchestrated. This, uh, <laughs> uh, this. Thank you, Katrien. Any other questions? Yes, Aliette. Wait for the microphone. I have two questions, actually. Um, uh, first, uh, you're a professor in radiology. Uh, how does this subject spark your interest? Yeah. Um, we have two floors. I'm at the ground floor because my machines are bigger. I'm a radiation oncologist who treats cancer. And the radiologist is a guy who, uh, upstairs who makes uh, the pictures. It's not an, uh, a mistake which, is, which, which is, is, is too bad because we take a lot of advantage of, of, of those images. We, we need those imaging to target our, uh, our problem. I got involved in it because a lot of my patients come with, with uh, after cancer treatment with, with, with those types of fake or difficult complaints where n no doctor can help and, and, and indeed uh, which is a signature of cancer treatment or of cancer itself. Uh, so yes, and I, as I started, the problem, the medical problem is real. Those patients come with real symptoms, real complaints and real difficulties. But the answer is even more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and my second question is uh, what, did, what do you think of the claims of the patient uh, organizations who say that uh, the, the way that the deficiency is measured now is not correct, uh, that doctors should measure the active B12. Uh, and 
I, I, th I had this discussion, of course, with our chem chemists, and um, um, what, what I found, I, I, I just talked also about chemists. You know, doctors are actually, if they sit together, they are really nice and they try to find a compromise. Chemists don't. Um, so I asked three chemists the same questions. I asked the guys in, in Rotterdam, uh, of course, of my own hospital, and in Groningen, and, and, and they, are, they are already quarreling what is the best way to measure it. So my honest answer is I don't know. But I do know the problem, yes. But, but the, their claim is that vitamin 12 uh, is, is um, how say that? Yeah, that, that you need it in an active form, that it, or you need it in, uh, in yeah, a direct form, which is not first pass, that there's no, fir what we call the first pass effects through the liver. Yeah, that there are two uh, proteins, uh, and, 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 and that they uh, should only measure the B12, uh, that is uh, connected to transcobalamin 2, <laughs> yeah. uh, because that, that sh uh, yeah. uh, would be the only... Uh, B12 that is yeah. Uh, Again, there suitable. is uh, and, and 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 I try to look in it, but the, the literature yeah. there on, on there on is is, is is very difficult for me to understand, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly also for chemists of the of hospitals, it's it's not it's almost unreadable literature, uh, be, be, because there is no evidence again. There, there there's no correlation. Uh, those, those chemists uh, with the seventy thousand samples there, I. Give me a li just a little money, a little time, and I, and I check those 70,000 samples, and I go after those patients and ask them, uh, with the different types of measurement, do you have symptoms? What are your complaints? And this connection is far, far more important than whether you have the good chemical tests in your lab, I think. Okay, thank you. Well, the, the thing is, they claim something new. That's great but then they should investigate it, publish about it, present it on conferences, talk to their colleagues. What usually happens in medicine if something new is found or invented, other universities in other cities are going to do the same research. If the same research shows the same positive result, then we've got really something new to add to medicine. We get together on a conference and we agree on new ways to uh, do lab uh, tests on our patients and we agree on new ways to treat our patients. But before that is done, uh, it's, it's not okay. Just claiming this is what I think and this is what I do and this is how I make my money um, without the proper research and Co collaboration with your colleagues is just not good. Yeah. Uh, question, Dr. Astor, are you going to talking about Lyme disease? No, no, we have uh, uh, Professor, Professor Vogelaars on Lyme disease. Oh, yeah, well, so I, I, you can skip I the mean, Lyme. I'm, I, <laughs> Lyme disease has the same problem. That, that uh, the diagnosis, that, that, that the real doctors or that the regular medicines make always the all the, well, no, they used the wrong test. They should, should, they, they took a drip from my right eye, and you know, you know, for Lyme disease, you have to diagnose it from the left eye. Yeah, things like that. Uh, one last question, yes. Pepijn van Erp, yeah. please wait for the microphone. So, if I understand this correctly, I have a little bit of pre-information. My, my wife is a specialist in internal medicine. She has a lot of these patients who visited yes. these B12 uh, clinics. Um, so those patients, they love, they love these injections. Eh? They think, well, if I get a shot, it help, really helps me. And the, it's, it's more cheaper to get these, these pills. And uh, so I'm, my question is, in these clinics, they uh, promote these shots because they make more money yeah, on it. They promote these shots. But what is their story? Because if, if I understand this, 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 um, this chemistry correctly, then, well, they say you have a B12 deficiency because you're below this level of 148. But after this shot, you, yeah, your levels go up. But how can they say, well, you need another shot? They have to do intermediate tests or... Yeah, they can only tell their patient that they need a shot if, if the, the yeah. levels, these objective levels, are below 148. 
I'm, I'm not ridiculing you now. My talk is about plain nonsense. Uh, it is plain nonsense. Uh, but, but do you know, we know what, what yeah, do they tell these patients? A, a pill has to be bitter. Uh, a, a treatment has to be painful. Um, and, 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 if, and, and there are no side effects. Uh, we know it from patients with, um, with breast cancer, uh, where um, patients can have, it depends a bit, uh, can have hormonal treatment, which has relatively few side effects, but, with, with in, in, uh, but is very effective. And uh, chemotherapy, which is effective, but less effective when, uh, when uh, may, may hormones. Talk, it's not exactly what, but I, what patients I want to know. Want want the chemotherapy with the side effects. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but that, that's not what I, 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 I understand this, that uh, the patients, maybe they love an injection over, over a pill, but these doctors, they have to give an, a reason before this, giving this injection. Yeah, bioavailability, they, 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 that, that, and that is of course true. Uh, but that, it, but it, then it, they are lying to their patients, because they say, well, yes. if They you, are if lying to their patients. They an are lying ordinary to patient yeah. uh, who depends on vitamin B injections needs one injection a month. Yeah. So giving three injections a week is nonsense. But why? Because, because they can, can write, it's an, a visit of five minutes, and you earn 300 euro in five minutes. I want to do that too. But when they test again after one month, and the levels are okay, okay they can say you need another shot. But but still, they do it. Yes. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, the, the other thing is, and I could, uh, I had a slide with all those, a, the whole alphabet of vitamins. One thing with vitamin B12 is that uh, the the surplus you will lose through your urine. You will pee it out. It will. It. It. it, it there are. I, I didn't talk about side effects of B12 because there are no side effects of B12. No, no side effects of overdose. And, and, and so, yeah. They, no, I. I think there are multiple options. So. Some patients may feel better, so they will Placebo. want to continue the treatment. Huh? And sometimes when, well, often the test is flawed, like in the Lyme clinics, the test is always positive. And lots of journalists send their blood, it's always positive. So they just do some kind of wacky tests that says you really have, still have B12 deficiency, or maybe nothing change, changes. And these patients will want to continue because the doctor said you will get even worse if you stop. And then there is a small fraction of these patients who, and it's a bit of a taboo to say, but who just really like being sick and having a Baxter and going to the clinic every month. And it's a small minority, but there are all kinds of psychological reasons why people will continue the treatment. I think on the next, uh, next conference we are going to have a session on treatment rituals and addiction to treatment. But for now I want to thank uh, Professor uh, thank Stalpers. You. Thank you.